make a difference. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Woody, do you have anything you wanted to say? No, uh, I'll echo that sentiment. Thank you for all being here. Woody is um, my co chair, he's the mayor of Largo, and a pretty important person to us in Tampa Bay, as well as on the council at this meeting as well. Um, is there anybody in here or online from the public that would like to make an announcement or be heard? All right, seeing no one, we're going to move on to announcements. That's agenda num number four. Do any of you from your agencies have anything you'd like to tell us about that you're doing for the organization you represent? <laughs> yes, ma'am. So Ann Paul here, um, I speak, would just like to- closer so we can hear it. Ann Paul here. And um, I would just like to remind everybody that the Florida Burning and Nature Festival is gonna be held in Apollo Beach in uh, uh, the end of October, October 20th through 23rd. And um, a number of the agencies represented here are sponsors. And we have at least one field trip leader also, Tom Reese. Thank you, Tom, right here. Um, and also, um, I just want to remind people too that Pasco and Polk County are have on their um, November ballot referendum for land acquisition to be voted for and approved, hopefully by their voters. And this is just such an important thing with the development that's occurring in our community. In, a set, in essence, in my view, it's now or never to protect the important conservation lands in those counties. And they do, you know, abut with uh, important conservation lands in Hillsborough and, and some of the other counties. So this is just a critical juncture with, I think, with regard to that aspect. Thank you, Ann. Does anybody else have something they'd like to announce? Yes, sir, and identify yourself for the Folks. Yes, Ed Sherwood, director of the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. Just want to let everybody know that our community-based Bay Mini Grant Program is accepting proposals. They're due next September, uh, next Friday, September 16th. So if you know of any community groups or your organizations that have an interest in a community-based project, either re to restore or uh, educate about the Tampa Bay Estuary, these funds are available. It's typically uh, funding up to about the $5,000 level. That funding comes from our license plate, the specialty license plate, TARP and TAG, that uh, hopefully you all have. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is that the uh, National Estuaries Week is also the week after our Bay Manning Grants are due from uh, September 17th through 24th. Uh, so we'll have a couple of announcements as well as some events uh, centered around bay cleanups that are uh, in collaboration with several partners. I think there's one planned at McKay Bay through the National Association of Environmental Professionals uh, and several other coastal cleanups that are escaping me right now. But check out our calendar if you want to look for volunteer opportunities to help out the bay. Does anyone else have something? Hi, it's Mark Luther from the USF College of Marine Science. Uh, the first week in October, we'll the Vinoy Hotel in St. Pete. While it's not directly related to Tampa Bay, we will be taking a group of folks from that conference out to Egmont Key for a field trip on October 7th. So if you happen to be out on Egmont Key, you'll see a bunch of uh, marine minerals types from around the world tromping about. Now, are these, uh, these different meetings that you all are talking about, are these things that some of our members could attend if they wish to? Certainly, I can send Alana the link to our uh, conference website if you like. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask Alana if she will publish this information on our website so that you all are reminded of the dates because they're important to all of us. Does anyone else have something they'd like to share with us? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, hey, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. This is uh, Chris Anastasio. Um, for, from the Water Management District. I'm the uh, Seagrass Mapping Program Lead. Just want to give the group a, a quick update. We are um, working diligently on uh, getting our draft seagrass maps for 2022 done. We're way ahead of our schedule that we had in 2020, so we expect to have all the maps completed uh, for Tampa Bay down to Charlotte Harbor um, 
at least in draft final draft form by the end of the calendar year. So stay tuned. I'm sure we'll be giving a presentation to this group uh, when the time comes on uh, where we stand in terms of our seagrass acreages for Tampa Bay in 2022. And also we are uh, gearing up now, uh, getting everything, uh, doing the, the pre-planning for our 2024 maps, which will include the Springs Coast region as well. So we map that region every four years uh, and then Tampa Bay to Charlotte Harbor, we map every two years. Stay tuned, more to okay. come. Thank you, great. Actually, one more I forgot as well. We we actually have two open positions as well that we're currently advertising for through the SRA program. If you go to tbep.org, we have an administrative specialist position that's currently over open, as well as an environmental social scientist position. Uh, we're looking for our applicants to fill those over the next month or so. So, if you know of anybody that has an interest in working for the Tampa Bay SRA program, please direct them our, our way. Okay. Anybody else here or online that would like to be recognized? Hi, this is Nancy Stevens with the Sierra Club, the Tampa Bay Group. Um, I just wanted to, to, to mention that we've been working with the city of Tampa for 20 months now, the Sierra Club and, and League of Women Voters, um, the Friends of the River, uh, we're on this pure project, which is to reuse the wastewater. Um, we've been trying to, uh, we've had a list of questions we've been asking and have still not received answers to. Um, so at this point, we, we are um, requesting that the funding for Pure be stopped um, and um, until those questions are answered. And um, you know, we still have a, a, a list of concerns. We're gonna put the wastewater into the river and to the aquifer and to the reservoir. And there's not been a clear indication of the safety and the cost of doing that. Um, and until those, you know, a list of questions and answers, we are coming out against it. And, and if anybody wants to any further information, um, um, I'm happy to provide it. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Yeah, <clears throat> this is Jason Cruz. I, I know I'm on the agenda a little bit later, but since we're uh, sharing announcements, I uh, want to take a moment to invite any and all of you that would be interested. We've got our annual turf grass field day where faculty and graduate students present and, and highlight recent research that they've been working on at the Plant Science Research and Education Unit in Citra, Florida. It's on uh, October 5th, Wednesday, October 5th. And this year, uh, I guess to kind of pat our own back, we are celebrating 100 years of our research and teaching program. So I will talk to you guys soon. Okay, folks, and all of you who have these announcements, please get that data also in writing to Alana so that we can put that on our website so people are aware of some of the stuff that you're doing. That's very, very important. Everyone in each of your agencies is critical. I'm going to move on uh, to an approval of our minutes of March 10th. This was an official meeting, so it, we do need an approval of that. Move approval. Yes, who? Is that and, a, and Paul. And so, made a motion. And our vice chair made a second. All in favor, say aye, please. Aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries now. We were having issues with the forum, but I still would like for the record to have that approved. May I have a motion, please? Approve approval of the June 9th, 2022 okay. meeting minutes. In a second. All these people, nobody wants Second. To. Thank you. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Thank you. All right, Alana is going to give us an update on uh, two subcommittees that met during the interim <laughs> from our last meeting. And uh, we, we formed these committees so that we can get into some of the roll up your sleeve type of work and sharing information with each other between our regular meetings. So Alana, would you take over please? Great, yeah. Well, both of our subcommittees of the ABM met since we last met in uh, May or I'm sorry, June. Um, so the Legislative Review Committee met on July 14th. Uh, both of these meetings were virtual, by the way. Um, so at the Legislative Review Committee, um, we had presentations on the local referenda in the area. So 
the Polk Forever referendum and the Penny for Pasco referendum. Um, we also had a presentation on a proposed bill by the Friends of the Hillsborough River to change their Florida statutes regarding the elimination of surface water discharges and associated reuse of reclaimed water. I encourage you to check out their presentation on the AVM materials webpage. And then we also reviewed legislative bills passed and signed into law from the 2022 legislative session, um, as well as the key 2023 legislative session date. And um, that session officially begins on March 7th, although the committees are likely to meet in January and February. Um, and then we also had a Natural Resources and Environmental Impact Review Committee meeting on August 10th. We had a really great turnout for that meeting. Um, we mostly spent uh, the meeting helping the Army Corps further prioritize their beneficial use sites for fresh material from Tampa Harbor. Um, you can find the final jam boards uh, on the ABM meeting materials webpage. I also have a copy here if, if anyone's interested in seeing that in person. Um, and uh, so the, the highest prioritized sites for the dredge material were Egmont Key uh, for island creation. Alifaya Bank Sanctuary Island creation and habit, hard bottom habitat creation. And then we also had a presentation from Hillsborough County on their new Greenways Master Plan update. Um, they pulled meeting attendees on what makes an ideal Greenway. I thought the results were interesting. Um, the, the features that received the highest number of votes were um, being safe from traffic, being close to nature, amenities, shade and social equity, and wildlife corridors received a lot of vocal support. It wasn't one of the options. And then we also discussed committee leadership, including appointing a new chair for that committee because we don't have one currently. I've been running the meetings. Um, and Sean College expressed uh, willingness to take on that role. So he'll be talking with our chair further um, about getting an appointment. So those are my updates on the two committee meetings. Anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Will this summary also be available to our members so they can have it? Sure, and the, the meeting minutes from both of those meetings are, you can find those on the ABM meeting materials page too. And that includes what I just said and a lot more. Yeah, so do check that out because there may be something that you would like to see further action taken on or something that you feel others need to be aware of so it's on our website right yes all right um today we're going to have some really interesting updates material that i know all of you are interested in most recently we've heard several times about the issues associated with the piney point facility down in manatee county and uh, today we're going to be updated on the facility, their closure plans. Uh, Dr. Mark Raines, uh, John Coates with the DEP, um, Herb Donica with the Donica Receivership Services. And I don't know if they have others here, but um, Chief Science Officer, Dr. Mark Raines, the DEP Program Managing Director, John Coates and Herb Donica has been designated as the receiver. They're going to provide an update on the progress of this site, closure plans, and so on. Um, the appointment of a receiver gave the way to expediting and the operations that now come from the receiver. So anyway, um, I've said enough. Let's hear from them. If you all wouldn't mind coming forward and introduce yourself again, and please share with us what's going on. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to um, uh, join you guys today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Raines. I'm a pro professor of geology at the University of South Florida. I'm also chief science officer for the state of Florida, which is the capacity I'm appearing uh, today. Uh, like you, I'm also a longtime resident of the Tampa Bay region. Uh, and also like you, I would very much like to see the Piney Point chapter be brought to a close and, and be put behind us. Uh, which is why I'm pleased today that we're going to talk not about things that happened so much in the past, but we'll talk about the future uh, and how we're making steady progress towards closure <clears throat> and uh, a related massive reduction in the risk that the Piney Point facility poses to uh, uh, our bay resources. I am uh, joined by a great team. Shannon Herbon is here in a supporting role. She's a program administrator with Florida Department of Environmental Protection. The real stars of the show are John Coates, who's um, 
uh, also program administrator at the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, he has a wealth of knowledge about uh, the Piney Point facility. And then her Donica, who is the court appointed receiver who's charged with overseeing um, the ongoing closure. And it's really those two who will do the bulk of the speaking today. I'll come back at the end. I'll make a few closing comments and then hopefully we can have a sort of wide ranging and transparent conversation by the time we're finished. You'll all feel sufficiently uh, briefed. Um, so with that, uh, John, why don't I turn it over to you? Thank you, Dr. Raines. And I want to, you know, on behalf of the department, really appreciate an opportunity to come and, and provide an update on the Piney Point, you know, facility, the site, and the closure. Very grateful to have Dr. Raines, Shannon, and Mr. Donica Herb here as a court appointed receiver. And, and, you know, really want to shout out and so much appreciate the work that the agency on Bay Management, the Tampa Bay Regional um, Planning, uh, forgive me, council do, I want to say commission, but council do. Because, you know, it's important to Central Florida, Southwest Florida, and indeed to the entire state. And uh, the work that I've seen you all do over the years, bringing people together with a wide range of expertise, stakeholders who care about this community and, and bringing in the agencies that really do care about protecting Tampa Bay and the state of Florida. So with that, and with hopefully some luck here with the technology, what we would like to do by the keyboard. So everybody online and here in the room, we're just trying to get the keyboard to do a page down. I was trying to figure out what you were doing here. Okay, so, right, so. Got it now. Okay. So what I would like to do first, everybody, and thank you for the patience. We talk a little bit about roles and responsibilities, you know, for for the site. Try to provide sort of a current information status of, of the Piney Point facility. Talk a little bit about the regulatory decisions that have been in here in the in the recent this current chapter for, for that site and focus then and transfer that over and, and, and her will be able to go through, I think, and really provide you the details, the updates, the kind of activities that are happening on the ground today that are important to the final closure of this of this facility. And so the, the department today, you know, we are under very clear direction from our leadership to ensure that this is the final chapter, that this is the closure of this facility once and for all. And what that really means for us is, you know, looking, you know, how could that happen? And the way to do that, the department stepped forward and asked the court to appoint a court appointed receiver somebody who could take that as that primary role to make sure that the closure is completed and who would have the authority of the court to take over the responsibilities and to be able to do things at the site that are beyond the regulatory roles of the department to actually be on site and to manage the day-to-day -day activities of the site that are absolutely essential to provide for the safety of the site and get it done, you know, get the closure done. So in, the, in that role, the department, you know, we, we are a regulatory agency and our role in working there, you know, both in interacting with the court, requesting the appointment of the receiver and in ensuring that the work is gonna be done properly is a regulatory role and our regulatory oversight is essential. And we also have the opportunity with the support we've received through funding appropriations to provide what is essentially necessary for the receivership to do its job is to provide funding and coordination and support for those day-to-day -day activities and for being able to get, get the closure work contracted, planned out properly, and then implemented over what's what's inevitably has to be a multi-year time frame. So the receiver and his responsibilities and, and, and her will, will go through and, and really give you some details that'll make this meaningful, but it's, it's really very, very straightforward. It's the closure of the site. That is everybody's goal together. And I think no matter where anybody sits here on the agency for Bay Management, Within the Regional Planning Council, the important aspect is to see this closure completely. And what it means today on the ground at the site is essentially converting the reservoirs that were previously constructed and turning those into stormwater management systems. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And to make that happen, what really, really is important is that the day-to-day -day site activities, that there's resources and sound decision-making that are intimately involved with the site. And so as, as Herb will talk through, 
that day-to-day -day oversight and activities, both with the department from a regulatory role and with the court appointed receiver, that's essential for making this work. And so current site conditions. I want to talk through a little bit about these, and then of course we can even handle any questions that may be may be helpful for folks. And really the you know the focus for the receiver has one been making sure that the site is safe. And that means that repairs that were done since 21 are holding the compartment that uh, the NGS South repairs have been completed there. There has been interim repairs in the drain systems at the site. So all the things that the receiver has done are in good shape. They are being closely monitored to make sure they are holding and providing for the safety of the site. So I think that's the first and most important piece of information to share today. The site continues to do day-to-day -day water management activities. So that includes there's still a treatment contract that the receiver is maintaining on site to be able to, to manage and treat water if necessary, you know, at the site. They've also continued to clean up water. And really what that means, of course, this site, the, the issue is primarily nutrients. And so removal of nitrogen and phosphorus levels that are in the pond, you know, the significant progress has been made there through the activities of the site. The site has removed about 34 million gallons of water since September of last year through the receivership's current coordination with Manatee County and their utilities department. They treat and remove water from the site each day. It's, it's about 100,000 gallons a day of water, but that is significant over time. And that has really led to the condition today being much better than we were a year ago at that site, of course. Spray evaporation is one of the systems that has been used at the site historically that continues to be maintained and managed by the receiver staff at the site. In a result of all those day-to-day -day activities, the site today has just a little bit over 27 inches of rainfall storage capacity. And I want to talk, you know, first, so that storage capacity really is the capacity where process water is managed at the site. And so that's the important piece. There is additional storage capacity in our contingencies that can be safely managed beyond that. But we talk about our storage numbers in terms of what the design facility should be able to safely hold at all times, regardless of, you know, storm conditions and things like that. So that number is a little bit over 27 inches today, which is in a very good place and through a lot of work that the receiver has done. The inventory at the site is always something that's of great, great interest, and we certainly understand that. We provide routine updates on the inventory in the NGS South um, compartment on our, on our website. The total volume of water here is the amount that's stored in the different areas of the site. These are the compartments that, that have some component of seawater and process water in them today. And the total is about 480 plus on 487 million gallons. And that's down from around 550 just through the ongoing work that's happened here over the last year, as well as, as, well as the, the site itself has been fortunate. There's been a lot of rainfall here in the last uh, month or so. In the area, the site to date, I think is around 34 inches of rainfall through this point in uh, 2022. So just a, a minute to talk about the closure plan, these regulatory actions the department has taken. So one the, one of the things that Herb has done, he's contracted with an engineering firm that's knowledgeable in these facilities, and they have put forth a conceptual closure plan. And that conceptual closure plan is a very important piece. It's not the entire story of what needs to be done. That conceptual closure plan, for example, I mentioned stormwater, and I'll talk a little bit about this on an aerial. So stormwater management, as you take this site, remove these reservoirs that have been problematic, remove them from the site, and complete exposure, you're going to be reconnecting areas that will then drain good, clean stormwater runoff. But you've got to make sure that that stormwater system is going to integrate into the rest of the site and, and most importantly, into the community, into the drainage areas around that. So the conceptual closure plan was a, a, and a really a very effective tool for getting the overall big picture, the timing, the sequence, the schedule for the closure activities, how and when will the process water areas be uh, removed and, and basically dewatered so that you can get construction equipment in there? How will that process work? And then how will that area physically tie in so that you have an effective and functioning, properly functioning stormwater system to produce clean runoff from the site. So those are kind of the essence of the overall conceptual plan. And as you go forward, they have produced the initial set of designs for the OGS South compartment. That one, as Herb will talk about, was able to go first because that one has never housed process water. 
So that currently just houses dredge materials from a 2011 Fort Manatee dredging project. And the area there is just, it's salty dredge materials. So it can't run off there, cannot go into the freshwater footprint that this site sits in because those are freshwater locations. And so that particular area, that stormwater can be managed working with the port as the receiver has done. And then that closure work can go forward while the plans are being you know, completed for managing process water from the site. So on March 30th, the department had reviewed and worked with, with Herb and his experts and provided comments. And as of March 30, the department did approve the conceptual closure plan. That closure plan requires the receiver to provide additional very, very detailed and specific information on each of the subsequent phases of closure. And the first phase of that was indeed for the OGS South, and the department approved that on June 8th of 2022. So I'd like to talk just a little bit about the site and then hand this over, most importantly, to Herb to really give you a, a sense of things at the site. So the mouse here hopefully is working for everybody both online and in the room. There are three primary compartments that house a combination of seawater and process water, which at this point in time is really an issue just primarily for the nutrient levels. NGS North and South and the OGS North compartment. So before closure work can commence on these three compartments, process water of course has to be safely and effectively removed from the site to allow construction equipment to go in there and the closure plan, one way of looking at the closure plan is to say that you know, the, the goal here is to eliminate these ponds that are atop the chip stack system. This is the OGS South that uh, Herb will talk more about that's currently under closure construction. So that's, that's to me, I think everybody here in, in Florida, very good news that that work is underway. The closure plan, one, one of the highlights, we get this question a lot, it's very, very understandable, is what will be done to make sure these areas no longer hold water in the future? So in addition to designing the, the appropriate things that you would do to manage both the quality and the quantity, the peak runoff rates that would come from this area, the, in each of the closure requirements, the, the, a portion of these dikes will have notches essentially cut in so that you know, going forward, this is truly a final closure. These compartments can never again be used to hold or impound water on top of the chip stack. And so that's a very crucial, very simple and basic element. The sequencing of work is, is outlined here. This is the current sequence. You know, things, things certainly could change, but right now the OGS South makes sense to get that work going and it's ongoing. And by the end of this year or early into 2023, the OGS South should be essentially closed. And once that happens, this area here, the dredge materials in here that make for just salty rainwater on this area, this will all be capped with an engineered system and it will produce clean stormwater runoff that will be freshwater runoff that will no longer have to go back to Port Manatee. These other different compartments here, because there's active water management spray evaporation system in the NGS North, right now the plan is to have that be the last area that undergoes closure. So the first removal of water from the site will focus on water in the OGS North and the NGS South, you know, here. And once this, the water removal is completed, then the closure work can begin in those areas. With that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Donica Herb, and I'm very grateful that he is aboard. Thank you, Mr. Coates. Dr. Raines. As you know, I'm, I'm Herb Donica, the court appointed receiver for the Piney Point site. Um, a lot of people ask me, what is a receivership? Under Florida law, it's probably the most flexible vehicle there is. There are no real guidelines within the statutory context. Uh, the judge can decide what responsibilities and powers the receiver has. In this case, uh, the department negotiated with the other parties in a pending lawsuit, uh, foreclosure lawsuit, Manatee Circuit Court, and they designed by stipulation the, uh, the order, the powers, and the responsibilities for the receiver. And then they proposed that the court 
uh, appoint me as the receiver in that case. The order is very broad, basically says I can do anything I need to do to close the stack system, that nobody really has any property rights left. The property itself is still owned by HRK Holdings, but they have no role in the management of the property and how I spend money and what I do to recontour the stacks. The responsibilities of the receivership are divided into two functions. The first one is ordinary day-to-day -day maintenance. We are maintaining the property. We have a staff of nine people on site. We staff the site 24 seven. We have somebody there all the time. Uh, the ordinary maintenance involves uh, landscape maintenance, uh, mowing, involves uh, testing the water every day. We, test, we also observe the water levels in a series of Kelly wells and piezometer systems around the property to determine activity within the stack system. All that's recorded every day, and those reports are shared with the DEP, and it helps us manage and anticipate what may be happening on the property. When you have 400 million gallons of water in above the ground stacks, you've got a lot of hydraulic sidewall tension against the walls. And that's what we're constantly monitoring to, to make sure that we can get ahead of any problems uh, that would, would cause a leak. The other function is the closure function. In, in regard to the closure function, I manage the contracts, uh, acquire materials and services via state and federal procurement rules. I do a lot of planning. I'm meeting with the DEP, meet with my engineers, meet with other experts. I have a separate uh, company that gives me uh, consulting engineers to, for a second opinion on major issues. And then with respect to both functions, I'm doing all the bookkeeping and budgeting. I'm doing continuous budgets, monthly and quarterly, sometimes separate for the site maintenance and separate for the construction part. And all that folds together into reports I file at the court quarterly. I also use those reports to uh, develop my funding requests. Uh, in connection with day-to-day -day site maintenance, we have regular safety meetings. All of our people are issued uh, productive gear, goggles, hard hats, uh, reflective vests. Uh, we also are continuously treating the water in New Jib Stack South. That's been the problem stack system that where we've had the leaks. As of a couple months ago, we had dropped out over 98% of the harmful nutrients. So if we did have another sidewall problem where we had a massive leak, that water goes into the bay naturally, it will not cause or exacerbate the red tide. The nutrients have been taken out of that. We're, we're disposing of those on site, but they're no longer in the water. With respect to the construction aspects or the closure, uh, Mr. Coates already related that the permit had been issued for the Romanity County's underground well. I understand that that's been drilled or almost completely drilled. They have started uh, construction on a very sophisticated pretreatment plant where the water will be treated prior to going down the well. It'll be treated also suspended solids will be filtered out of the water. <clears throat> Excuse me. I should have anticipated that because we spend hours every day on conference calls. Uh, so the, the well and free treatment plants coming along, it, they have experienced some delays. As I understand it, mostly supply chain delays. So the plant will come online sometime in 2023. I think it's right now they're hoping for the mid-year initiation of water disposal services. 
Also, as Mr. Coates mentioned, on March 30, the department approved the conceptual closure plan. Two days later, on April 1, I submitted advertisements to 19 counties in Central Florida for our first construction contract to remediate Old Gyp Stack South. Uh, we had a uh, pre-bid meeting on April 15. 25 contractors came to the site, came to our modular office there, and we gave a presentation with our engineers, and we got uh, bids later in May. On June 17, I was able to make the announcement that Forgen LLC was selected as a contractor to perform services on Old Jet Stack South, closing it out. Uh, meanwhile, I solicited bids for materials by directly buying the materials. I saved 15 to 20% on markup rather than have the contractor go out and source the materials. We've been working on sourcing those materials for a while. We now are under contract for about $3 million worth of materials. We'll also be purchasing another $3 million of fill dirt and sand, which we'll use to recontour the inside walls of the stack systems. <clears throat> we completed our contract negotiations with Forge and LLC on August 12th and they are now on site recontouring Old Gyp Stack South. In order to get them in there, we had to drain some storm water that was inside the stack. The stack was dry, but as Mr. Coach related, it had been raining. We had about four and a half million gallons of water inside Old Gyp Stack South. You can't get the heavy equipment in there to recontour it while it's underwater. So we, we drained it. Uh, we used a decant pipe, went directly to the bay. The water was storm water and we tested it continuously during that effort to get the water drained so the forging could uh, go in and commence their activities. I've been very happy with forging. They've been uh, working with our site staff uh, in a very good way. They have, we have uh, coordinated efforts while Forgen is working on top of the stack system, we're having 60 to 80 dump trucks deliver sand and soil every day. And we're piling that up for Forgen to use to complete the recontouring of the stacks. So uh, we have a traffic pattern. Uh, we have flag people. We have mirrors that see around corners. We, we put a large emphasis on safety. We have a meetings with Forgen every morning before they start. Uh, interestingly enough, they, they start off their morning doing calisthenics. <laughs> so, uh, I was happy to see that they have such an emphasis on health. Uh, but we have an integrated safety plan where our site people and the Forgen people have the same safety protocols. So if there's any injuries, we can address it right away. So far, no injuries. And it's pretty remarkable given all the movement of people, machinery all over the stack system. Uh, meanwhile, we're continuing to monitor the water quality. We're doing our reports. We have a lab on site where we do our testing every day, 24 hours a day. And then we uh, periodically, we do the regulatory issues. We have uh, bench, benchmark and viral analytics, an in independent lab come out and pull samples and give us reports on the water quality for different areas among the stack system. So we're, we're staying on top of that. We're current all the reports and we submit those reports to the DEP. Uh, the water that was decanted from Old Jet Stack South, we tested that continuously before, during and after delivery to the Bay. The nit total nit nitrogen range was ranged from 2.3 to 3.5 per uh, million parts, which is less than one tenth of 1% of what the guidelines call for, which again proves that it's just stormwater and harmless. Uh, because it uh, was on top of the dredge material and it'll just stack south, it picked it up uh, some salt or salinity 
but it was still not as uh, uh, the, the conductivity was less than what the bay was, where the water was going. So nothing untoward happened with that uh, uh, release of stormwater. So we are we are underway. There's a I think we included some pictures. Am I supposed to do this? Here is the activity in Old Gyp Stack South. You can see uh, excavators and bulldozers pushing the dirt and sand around. This is a precursor to a new drainage system. So we have slotted pipes that are going to go into that area that acts as a French drain, actually drawing any water out. It will then be relined, a new line over top, two feet of topsoil, and then vegetation. That two feet of topsoil will protect that liner from the UV rays from the sun, also from heat and cold. That is, temperature changes tend to make that liner expand and contract. And along with the UV rays, it will become brittle and won't last as long as it should. By covering it with two feet of topsoil and vegetation, we'll keep it pinned down, will not move, and also won't be exposed to that, those great differences in temperature. So that's a permanent solution. So that will uh, fill out full gyp stack south, the other three ponds will be treated the same way, except they have to be drained first. We have to drain them. There's some sediment on the bottom. We got to pull that sediment out, get it out of the way. It's not, it's too soft. It's not going to support the liner. So we, we'll be working on that sometime next year. Uh, once the uh, deep injection well gets uh, into, into operation. Pardon me as I go through my notes. I want to make sure I uh, address everything. I believe that's it for now. We are we are underway, and it's great seeing activity out there. Everybody's excited, and uh, you know we we've had the press come out several times to take a look. They especially like to fly their drones over the property now, and it's. Uh, uh, it, it's, you can feel the excitement that we're actually closing this out and going to make it safe. Uh, it will no longer hold the water. The stormwater uh, management system is a wondrous thing. We went through several meetings uh, using computer generated uh, models to show where the water is going to end up, where we can hold it temporarily, where we can slow it down. If we have a 25 year rain event, I believe it will take 104 hours for it to drain, but it will drain. That's the important part. So, thank you very much. Uh, just before you leave, uh, like an opportunity, so don't leave. But this whole presentation is over because I know this has been a major, major issue for the residents of Tampa Bay, and particularly this group in the RPC. I think you're a very brave man. <laughs> but I also understand that you have an excellent reputation and that uh, Dr. Raines and Dr. Coates put a lot of thought into selecting you as our receiver. We appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I know that Alana may wish to check with you to get some uh, outline of your notes so that we can, it will be online, your presentation. But, you know, we may, she may want to check with you on a couple of points because this will also be presented in a brief summary at the Regional Planning Council meeting. Uh, Dr. Coates, did you want to speak now? Yeah, just, just wrapping it up. The, the, this is the path forward. It's real simple. Closure is the number one priority. Uh, I, I don't hear any daylight uh, between the way anybody is talking about this, not in this room or in DEP leadership or statewide leadership. Um, that's going to require us some time. So we have some ongoing water management issues to, to, to continue with. But even after closure, this is still a place and there'll be long-term uh, care and water management 
um, moving into the future. But with closure, we should massively reduce the, the risk that the site poses to um, the bay. Um, uh, we are happy to stay and, and, and answer questions right now. I know that um, maybe these questions won't arise today or you'll think of something later or, or, um, or, or maybe we just run out of time. So we do want to leave this slide up there while we answer questions. You can see that uh, um, all of our email addresses are there um, and we are happy to um, respond to any other inquiries for information. Um, and also, um, I know this is my second uh, trip to the Camp Bay Regional Planning Council. Um, I apologize that so much time has passed since my last one, but we're happy to come back again in the future to continue okay. giving you updates on, uh, as we progress. But with that, we're done. Um, if, if you guys okay. want to um, ask any Dr. questions. Dr. Raines, I'm going to see if anyone here in the ABM or online has a question they might like to offer up. Somebody have a question they'd like to ask Dr. Raines? I, I just had a quick Go question ahead. about the liner. Um, what What's the life expectancy? It sounded like that was, you, I'd heard you say that was a permanent solution. Um, is there any expectation in the future to have to go in at some point and replace that liner or, or is it is it truly permanent? Sure, I mean, very important question. The liner that, you know, when liner is exposed, the liner that's at the site, in, including the new liner that be deployed at the site is UV protected to last, you know, the, the, the indications are in the testing are, you know, well more than 50 years and stuff like that. But when you place it, it's, as Herb was correctly saying, when you place that material, you know, under the soil cover and you no longer have a pond and impoundment, you know, a high head system that's sitting on top of that liner, we would expect that liner to long, you know, you know well outlive the, the time frame at which you're trying to prevent infiltration down into the remaining gypsum, you know, in this stack system. So it's important to go ahead and get it completely done and closed. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is that these pond areas will be rendered so that they will not hold water in the future. As, as Dr. Raines mentioned, you know, the, once the closure work is done, you know, the, the site will continue to be there and we'll continue to need maintenance and environmental monitoring to make sure that it's being maintained. And the not having ponds active there storing water on top of the stack system is a crucial change from what was done in the past. Great. Thank, Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, um, with the delays with the pre-treatment plant, um, looks like the well won't be operation until midpoint of next year, you're saying, likely? So the, the, the pre-treatment facility will, will take a little bit longer. Um, you know, Manatee County has been an excellent partner in, in working with the receiver, you know, on this and they are, you know, their well is on target to be completed really essentially in December. They've got an additional monitoring well that they're putting in in conjunction with the deep well. So that's some of the last work that'll be done here during this calendar year. And the treatment facility itself will be, you know, there are projections, you know, they're hoping to get it certainly as soon as possible in early 23, but with supply chain, you know, availability and, and things like that that impact everybody in construction projects, unfortunately, these days, you know, the, the time frame may extend into mid of 23. The county and the receivers, I understand, it, are talking, and of course, and the department is supporting those discussions. There is a lot of pretreated water already at the site, and there may be the ability to go ahead and use that pretreated water that's at the site and work with the county and be able to utilize the deep well prior to them having their complete pretreatment facility up and running. And whatever the case is, you know, it'll make sure that water is properly pretreated. And meets all the requirements so that it works properly with the uh, the deep injection well. So there's a collective effort. Everybody is focused on the timing of this and wants to make sure that the closure work can go forward as expeditiously as possible. And you know the right people, I guess, are working on that and talking about what options are there to kind of expedite that time frame. And the target rate is still about one MGD through the well. With I, at the target policy. rate of uh, eliminating some of the the uh, process water is about one MGD through that well. The, the pretreatment facility in the well would, is targeted to one million gallons a day. And if there was something that was done interim, it may, you know, maybe less than that during the early part, but it would be one million gallons a day, that's correct. Thank you, Ed. Is there another question over here? I think Tom, Reese, you were next and then you, go ahead, Tom. Yes. Um, thank you. I, I have one question and one comment. How much of all this costing is a question? So the, 
you know, the, the emergency response, you know, obviously cost, you know, quite a bit, you know, earlier in, you know, in, in during 2021. The current appropriation is for 100 million. Um, and, and that is the funding that through the agreement between the department and the receiver that are being made available to make sure that the receiver has the resources to do that important day-to-day -day management and to provide for the closure work. The first phase of closure has been bid out for the OGS South, the other probably three phases essentially. Once as that closure work continues to get bid out, you'll, you'll know more about what the current market conditions are providing for pricing. It, it, it is a, it's not a good time to buy wood you know, for, for repairing your back deck, unfortunately. It's, it's, it's not been a good time to, to have to do heavy construction either. And so once the additional, you know, contracting and the competitive procurement process unfolds, we do anticipate there will be an additional appropriation during the 23 legislative session. And that number will, will be, we expect to be sufficient to complete this important closure work and also to set the stage for the, for the long-term care of the site. Okay, um, before so, Dr. Luther, oh, wait a minute. I just oh, had a, another? Go yeah. ahead, Tom, sorry. sorry. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you all, DEP and the, uh, the ridership for um, what you're doing. This should have, should have happened 20 years ago. Um, and I'm glad to see it's happening now and it's happening right. But what the commentary is, where's the phosphate industry? They're not standing up there with you. They built this, they profited from this, and they're out of the picture. Um, it, something has to change where the phosphate industry puts a small amount of money aside for the material they're pulling out of Florida to take care of legacy issues like this. Us taxpayers should not be paying for this kind of stuff. And, and that's all I got to say. Thank you. Yeah, I great, greatly appreciate you know that perspective, and and this is a a a legacy issue. The the Piney Point facility was a facility that operated prior to the current financial insurance requirements. The department took actions in two thousand six to strengthen financial insurance requirements, and much of the industry in Florida is is working under under you know mineral processing initiative that was worked out with the state of Florida and the federal government. And that also supports making sure there are, there are appropriate financial assurances in place because nobody here, you know, with the department, um, with the public, you know, wants to see this kind of circumstance ever happen again. And so this is something that predates the current regulatory framework. And, and we certainly hope that what we have today and the cooperative uh, agreements and settlements that have been reached are providing for those financial assurances to make sure that a place like this does not happen again. Thank you. And just adding on to that, Tom, we have every intention of holding HR care accountable for uh, their own site. I mean, this is this it's not just being hung around the taxpayer's neck. Um, we do have uh, plans in place and in, in action to um, ultimately hold HR care accountable to the extent possible, so. Okay, does that answer your question, Tom? All right, um, we've two more people that have indicated an interest in asking a question and I missed Mark. So let me get him with Audubon and then Dr. Luther, if you wouldn't mind. So Mark, are you still with us? I am, thank you. Um, so Mark Rochelle with Audubon. Um, I have uh, two questions. Of course, one is a bird question. Um, the first is, and I may have missed this um, in, in previous discussions, but who will own the stacks long term? We talk about you know the closure period, and then after that, long term management is it state owned? Um, who will be um, uh, in ownership and and responsible for management? Um, and then the second question is uh, more comment is that um, those sites, <laughs> especially during construction, will become um, bird nesting sites. So this past season. Um, Florida Fish and Wildlife um, biologists um, who um, has less who have uh, who has left FWC Tyson Dallas um, documented some beach nesting bird activity in those cells. Um, again, you know, seeing the area of the big sandy area, um, it, it makes sense. Um, so that will be an ongoing issue every bird season. So we have um, skimmers, terns, um, plovers that like to nest in these areas. Um, we have them nesting in the Port Manatee facilities on the island just offshore. Um, so I, I just want to make you aware that's going to be an ongoing issue going forward. We're happy to uh, help and coordinate uh, and make sure that um, we can avoid impacts to the bird nesting. But um, I, I guess that's a comment and a question. Do you have a plan in place? And 
Um, is there a way to coordinate on that? Thank you. Those are great questions. Uh, and I've been looking for an owner. So if you want to uh, contact me, that'd be great. Uh, but here's the problem. HRK Holdings owns the property. It is in foreclosure right now. Uh, Regions Bank had made a large a loan to HRK when it was in uh, bankruptcy in 2012 as a kind of exit funding for the Chapter 11 bankruptcy reorganization for HRK, which really didn't reorganize very much of anything. Uh, Regions Bank took a harder look at the situation. They sold the mortgage and note to a private investment outfit out of Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, it's called uh, Fortress 2020 Landco, I think is the name. I, I think of Mark Stout, he's the principal, uh, he's been very good to work with. They filed the foreclosure. They will end up foreclosing on portions of the property. It doesn't take a lot of brain work to figure out which portions they're going to foreclose on. They're going to foreclose on uh, the acreage along Highway 41 that they did not sell during their bankruptcy. They're going to foreclose on other parts that are uh, east, no, west, west of the GIP stack system. They are not going to foreclose on the GIP stack system. So that means that the end of the foreclosure case, HRK will own the property still, just a much smaller footprint, but it will be consist of the stack system, which I believe will still have a negative value. So I don't know what's gonna happen. Um, I like to see a responsible party come up with a plan. I have been privately suggesting that somebody raise some money, we transfer it to a uh, not-for-profit company, raise some money, make it some type of wildlife refuge. Uh, the wildlife have already voted for that. We've, uh, we've removed eight alligators in the last year. Uh, they seem to get curious about the dive teams when they're in the water. Hmm. So we've removed them, removed a family of feral hogs, we had a very large colony of least terns take up residency on their way to Cuba. So they rested up before they go to Havana to hit the bars and the jazz clubs. So they, uh, there was a beautiful sight to see them come and go. And they, they nested there and I understand they're on their way to Cuba now. I would hope that we can do that. I would hope somebody can, but it's gonna take some money because whoever owns it, is going to have to manage it, the landscaping, the vegetation, keeping it safe. Maybe you have to build a fence around it. It, it, it still is going to be large ponds. It won't be holding water except during a rain maybe, but I wouldn't want people to go in there unsupervised. I don't want people going in there, there with their ATVs tearing up the ground and maybe the liner, the new liner that we're installing. So I, I hope it can be actively managed and preserved for the public. It's, it's not going to be developed. There's nothing to develop there. And to move all the gypsum out would cost, well, nobody's estimated. It's going to be several hundred million dollars. And for what? You, you don't get anything for that. So because it's still not usable because of the residual radioactivity within the gypsum that's down below. So I, I hope that we can do something. I hope we'll get some ideas in the next couple of years before I'm done with my job. Because once I get the closure letter from DEP, I do my final accounting. I'm gonna sell the four pieces of equipment we have. I'm gonna lock the padlock and walk away. I'm done. So I, I hope something happens. I really hope somebody comes up with a plan and some funding attached to it so we can protect the public, but protect the wildlife also. Well, two quick things, because we have a couple other agenda items. 
Will you be able to hang around a little while after the meeting if some individuals have questions? If Dr. Luther has one, he needs to bring up, and then we have a couple other issues. But I just want to throw in an idea. Um, I hope you'll come back to us with the information when it gets closer to the time that you are closing uh, the property and uh, leave us with the Audubon and some of the others here who may have some productive ideas. But the brilliant thought that I had, which is probably isn't too brilliant, but when you start selling properties or getting any money from it, maybe there could be a way that some of that could be set up uh, specifically to address some of these wildlife issues. Um, there may, I mean, I'm no pro in that, but I know having worked with some of these groups in the past, there's probably a lot that they could offer you guys. Okay. Yeah, and 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 in the interest of time, we, we're not going to sort of figure that out now. But Mark, you see my email there. Um, please do feel free to reach out. We would love to hear Autumn and Florida's thoughts on. Uh, um, how to how to best manage those bird populations. I'm a geologist, but I am a rather enthusiastic, though below average bird watcher. I can assure you those species are there. Um, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on how to manage them, especially as construction gets going and things get a little busier out there. Um, we, so um, just reach out to me at, at your convenience and we'll pick it Thank up. Thank you. Uh, just quickly, uh, I and several other people in this room worked on the process water discharges 20 plus years ago. Are there any circumstances that you might perceive that would require discharging additional process water into the bay uh, during the closure? I think, you know, so certainly the receiver is keeping the infrastructure there. If there needed to be a treated water discharge, that he would be able to do that and take care of the nitrogen and phosphorus and, and have good water quality there. But there's everything is being done at the site to manage with, you know, under the department's sort of requirements to minimize any potential for a surface water a discharge um, after all the careful consideration the uic well we think it's going to be a very safe and effective way for removing the process water from the site so there's no question about having nutrient concerns in in tampa bay and everything is being done to, to you know continue to, to manage the site so that there will not be any any treated surface water discharge there will not be a need for that Always plan for contingencies. Make sure you're doing everything you can to protect things, but, but the plan is to not have any discharges. Yeah, and just to, to add on some assurances to that, this is a real different site than it was in March 2021. Um, first of all, the, the leak is repaired, but also the plumbing is completely different. It's 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 much modernized, and and uh, um, and then with the hard work at bringing the water levels down, there's a lot of storage there, 27 inches, unless we get hit with a depression storm or hurricane that just sits on top of us, we're probably going to be pretty good in the short term. And um, so I think it's a very different site. And then furthermore, um, you know, we have treatment on site. We have a facility on site. They treated water in NGS South and OGS North um, uh, for months, and they recycled it, circulated it on site. So already the, the, the nitrogen phosphorus concentrations in those two compartments are an order of magnitude lower than that, what they were before. And if, if when they're treating at their best capacity, they can get both total nitrogen and total phosphorus down below one milligram per liter. Okay, so Rains. With any, with any luck, we don't have to do so. But if we do, um, I think we're in a good position to, to do so. Would there be some way that periodically, um, maybe we you could meet with Alana and set this up, that we could have quick updates as this is going along? Because sure. apparently this is going to take a while. But I know that of all the people in the, in the Tampa Bay region, this group has the strongest interest in how this goes. And your report here is very important to us, but we also want to keep track of what's going on. So you mind, you know, working out something where maybe we have an update online and perhaps at some of our future meetings, you can give us a brief update because this is very, very important. We're absolutely happy to come um, at any time. So, um, and Alana's got my email address and can, can reach out to me. Right. Um, so we'd be happy to come back. Thank, Thank you, you so much, each of you for your role and for coming here today. Okay, moving on our agenda. Um, we come to item number eight. And this issue of the artificial turf was brought to our attention by the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. Uh, their policy board has been considering this 
because of the environmental impacts of, of artificial turf. And there's become a growing pressure from the development community to install turf. But we've also been hearing that local governments have expressed an interest in learning about the latest research uh, that can quantify it. Regular of artificial turf should be addressed uh, in the future and currently in land development regulations. So Dr. Cruz is Jason Cruz, he's with the University of Florida, is here and he's going to present some of the latest science on this issue. Dr. Cruz. Thank you, and I appreciate you guys uh, inviting me, Alana, and, and the Tampa, uh, Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council for asking me to come and speak about this. Uh, I agree, this is a topic that bear, yeah, it necess necessitates discussion. It is uh, something that's been actually on our radar for a number of years. Uh, we were approached <clears throat> at the University of Florida and IFAS by the Synthetic Turf Council back uh, in 2013, 2014, uh, with the question of whether or not synthetic turf could be something that would be considered in our Florida Friendly Landscaping Program uh, at that point and, and to this day. Uh, in fact, I'm going to share a, a link, and I'll, I know that it'll get shared out with the presentation. Um, we, we have a, a strong stance that synthetic turf grass systems do not currently have a, a role in a Florida friendly landscape in the in specifically in residential type landscapes and I'll do my best to uh, kind of keep this short I know that uh, we're you know my time is is kind of brief here um, but I will be able to stick around and ans answer some questions if there are any after the rest of the agenda is complete and with that I will uh, bring up my presentation here So can you guys see that fine? Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. So the um, the just this last year, we actually, uh, in response to many of these questions that, that you all are probably receiving about the use or consideration of synthetic turf in the residential landscapes in Florida, uh, pulled together uh, EDIS document that summarizes the to the best of our ability, be, that based on the research that exists, the considerations and impact that should be, you know, taken a look at when looking at synthetic turf in a residential type environment. Now, for context and, and brief summary, synthetic turf grass systems have their roots in athletic fields. Uh, they have been around for, you know, around the 1970s. Uh, with the first AstroTurf type installations uh, used in, in sports fields. They, unfortunately, in some cases, but you know, they do still have uh, a stronghold in athletic field type installations. Uh, I'm not saying that synthetic turf is bad in an athletic field installation. Uh, there's just places where it makes sense and other places where uh, it maybe shouldn't. Uh, in a residential landscape, though, it is a, a very different consideration, and I think it's something that's worth discussing and worth, you know, hopefully trying to get a better understanding of. Um, we're, I mean, at the end of the day, we're looking at this as a driving force. My colleagues and I, we all recognize that the urban landscape in Florida is going to change as the population grows. As our population grows, our demand for water increases, for potable water specifically increases, there will be changes and there will be uh, shifts in what our what we view as our traditional residential landscape will look like. As I mean, if you take a look at predictions of how much of this, you know, central part of the state is going to be urbanized, um, it, it is a it is an issue we are well aware of. It is an issue that my colleagues and I are working on, uh, that we're interested in trying to address concerns, you know, that face our industry, face our state now and in the future. Um, a lot of the work that we do looks at water quantity and water quality in the urban landscape, the impacts of urban landscapes in terms of their uh, 
plant palette, uh, the design, the you know implications of management, uh, how we can maybe select and choose you know, more, you know, I guess easy to manage, easy to maintain plants, and how that would look both in the short and long term. Trying to really ultimately address this as what we're going to be facing in the years to come. I am going to basically use the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program as a framework to, to shape this discussion. Uh, it is a established program in the state that really focuses on improving water quality, uh, minimizing impact on natural resources and, and the environment, and improving things like wildlife and, and drainage and infiltration and things like that. So you know, with that in mind, you know, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program does not have any one prescribed design or expectation for what someone's landscape might look like. Whether or not, you know, someone thinks that this is a Florida Friendly Landscape is probably up to, you know, everyone's opinion. Um, when you look at this and, and look at it from a critical standpoint, this landscape, while not aesthetically pleasing, is doing one thing for sure that is very important to our water quality. It is going to, it is creating a, a permeable surface that's going to slow down and, and encourage infiltration of water into our aquifers. It's going to reduce runoff. It's going to reduce and, and minimize soil erosion. And so from the standpoint of trying to protect water quality and improve water quality, while not aesthetically pleasing, this landscape, this plant community is probably doing a, a pretty good job of that. Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is really, the mission of it is to protect the water quality, water bodies, natural resources, and encourage and, and you know, help people find ways to adopt environmentally friendly, friendly landscape practices. In, in a nutshell, the, the primary things from a plant community standpoint, promote landscapes that conserve water, they protect the environment, are adaptable and appropriate for local conditions, and are drought tolerant. Now the drought tolerant aspect of this, or the use of water in a landscape is something that often turf grass, natural turf grass systems are targeted for. They are viewed by some that, that they use more water than what is necessary. Um, a lot of the research, uh, there's been a significant amount of research that Colleagues of mine, both here in Florida and across the country, have have looked at when we look at specifically residential landscape systems. Uh, Dr. Dukes, uh, and AG AJ Reisinger, and others have been looking at this. The water use in a residential landscape is often tied to problems with management and issues with how scheduling is done with the irrigation systems, issues with maintenance of the irrigation system that lead to increases in water use and not actually the demand or requirements of the plants that are in that landscape. The principles uh, and, and the EDIS document that I shared a link with um, on the this slide, and I'll put it in the chat here when I'm done talking, but uh, we went through, uh, a number of my colleagues and I went through and looked at the Florida Friendly Landscape, Man uh, landscape Management Principles and put that in the context of synthetic turf in a residential landscape system. Um, right plant, right place, watering, fertilization, all of these different principles we went through and looked at. The primary thing I'm going to focus on with my discussion with you today and, and talk about is the, really the need to increase or, or at least encourage infiltration of water rather than runoff. Impervious systems in a urban landscape create a tremendous amount of runoff increase the you know, challenges of flooding, can overwhelm our stormwater systems. And our urban landscape, in both, whether it's commercial or residential, plays a really important role in trying to minimize that runoff. The larger the amount of impervious surfaces, whether that's buildings and roofs or parking lots, sidewalks, driveways, obviously the more pressure is put on the, the stormwater system. And hopefully our planted landscape can help mitigate some of that. Specifically, 
looking at the artificial turf from the Florida friendly landscaping standpoint, our concerns are really centered on three real things here. Number one, the synthetic turf grass systems, specifically in a residential landscape, mm. reduce groundwater recharge. They increase heat, they increase glare uh, in terms of reflection of light, and they have not been shown to do anything to increase wildlife habitat. To give you a little bit of context in terms of their construction and installation to help help you understand where we're coming from with this, uh, synthetic turf grass systems are simply a rug. Uh, they're made in carpet factories. They have uh, fibers at the top you know, that are longer to mimic what you would typically see a lawn to look like. Um, when they're, this is in the manufacturing process, when they're complete, they have a rubber backing on it to help hold the fibers in place and lock them down. Uh, they put holes in it. I've got a diagram I'll show you in a second. They put holes in it periodically to help with drainage of water through it, but they are a petroleum-based product that is installed over a compacted surface. And I'll show you some, some pictures of that here in a second. This, I mentioned that this is in the context, you know, initially had its context in athletic fields and in athletic field construction, they're designed to infiltrate water. The, the systems are built with, uh, you know, layers in place that will infiltrate and get water out of that system through the ground. Now, that still probably ends up in a stormwater system. I understand that. Uh, it, but the they are designed to infiltrate through the system and try to minimize runoff. Minimizing runoff is important because in the synthetic turf grass systems that are used on athletic fields, they use a crumb rubber and sand infill mix. And if you start to get sheet flow across that system, the crumb rubber tends to float and move with it. And you can also have the, the carpet, the, the synthetic turf system float if you've got that much water and start to dis displace. And then you're looking at a, a renovation or a re reinstallation of the system to try to get it back to a playable condition. Um, but in those athletic field type installations, they excavate the site down to 18 to 24 inches. They come back with a gravel bed with drainage in it. Uh, they will often have some sort of geotextile fabric to help uh, reduce you know, any movement of sediment up or down. Uh, and then there's the hard rubber, the, the, uh, the rubber backing on the, on the carpet. They are essentially built like a roadbed. Um, very, very firm, hard surfaces for a number of reasons that I'll talk about in a little bit that are not unique to the athletic fields, but uh, they do build them to be very compact. They don't want them to settle. They don't want them to, uh, if they drive a, uh, a golf cart across it or anything, they don't want it to leave tire tracks. And, and that would arguably the same, be the same sort of con, uh, concerns that we would have in a residential landscape. A homeowner wouldn't want their lawn to, to be displaced and start to have the contour of that landscape change because somebody pulled off on the side of the road and pulled up onto their, you know, their grass a little bit, or maybe they needed to move something into their backyard. Uh, these systems by design need to be very compacted and, and firm in the base to try to minimize the chance that they ever would need to try to fix that contour. Because unlike a natural turf grass system where we can cut the sod back a little bit, put in some fill dirt, lay the sod back down and fix our, our topography, it is a much more involved system for fixing a res, uh, an artificial turf grass system. I've got a couple of pictures here that show typical residential landscape installations of artificial turf. Uh, I wanted to point a couple things out to you here. Uh, they do not excavate this down to uh, a depth of, like I said, 18 to 24 inches and build this back. What they will typically do is sod cut out and, and bring the grade down you know, one or two inches, maybe three inches to get their uh, sand and, and crushed gravel profile in place. This sand and crushed gravel uh, mix here is meant to provide the final grade that the carpet is going to be laid on. And it is always compacted down uh, both the 
original soil base is compacted and then they spread the gravel over the top of it and they will compact it again to make sure again that that's firm and is not going to settle hopefully over time. Uh, another picture of this, another installation that was made and, and this was a quote that I had pulled from the, the uh, presentation or the, the advertisement essentially is what it was. You know, is that at this point, if the bobcat dries over the prepared base, you will not see any tire marks. It's literally as hard as rock, which is exactly what you want. The base of the residential installations has to be firm for these systems to be successful long term. What does that mean when we start to look at things like infiltration rate, runoff in our residential landscapes? Uh, I don't think it's a, a big leap for anyone to understand that a a natural turf grass system, our residential plant, natural plant landscapes, the root systems that are there, even in a compacted soil, if we look at new construction where typically sites can be relatively compacted, when the plants are allowed to grow in those landscapes over time, the roots will actually loosen that soil and you will see an increase in infiltration rate as that landscape matures. That is not going to happen here because we're not going to have roots that are going down and exploring that soil, breaking apart those colloids, and in helping to increase soil structure over time. This is going to stay compacted and, and the implication of that is going to be reduced infiltration and increased runoff. There are other management concerns to take into consideration when putting these, these synthetic turf grass systems into landscape. Weed control is going to be a problem, maybe not in the short term, but over time weed control is going to be a problem. They as seeds get blown in, birds drop them, they move in with wildlife, there will be weeds that come into these systems and they will need to be managed. And so the argument that they will not require any pesticide you know, you know, use to maintain them starts to disappear pretty quick because we do ultimately have to manage weeds as these, land, as these synthetic turf grass systems uh, age. Cleaning them. Uh, in our natural turf grass systems, it's, you know, it's not always that hard. I mean, obviously, if you've got a mess like this in a natural turf grass system, you know, you may be scooping it or you may not be. Um, but in a synthetic turf grass system, there's not the same sort of microbial activity, the same sort of system that allows for this to break down and disappear over time. And it will ultimately be, a, you know, it's a sanitation problem for the people that might want to use and enjoy that site. Heat. These, if you've been to a, you know, a football or a soccer game or a baseball game where they're playing on synthetic turf, you know they're warm. They are warmer than natural turf grass systems. I have uh, myself looked at artificial and natural turf grass systems side by side here at the Florida uh, practice facility prior to the recent renovations and everything, uh, everything has been changed. But when we had a synthetic turf system there on a 90, it was about a 94 degree day, the surface temperature of the Bermuda grass was right at hundred and the surface temperature of the synthetic turf grass system was around 160, 159, 160 degrees. Uh, they are significantly warmer and they're, you know, if we were to see widespread use and inclusion of synthetic turf grass systems in residential landscapes, the heat island effect of that would certainly have an impact on the energy that's required to cool our homes because we would be creating a much warmer environment around, you know, in terms of the air temperature around our residential community. Load bearing weight. I mentioned the that these need to be stable systems. If a you know, if somebody were to drive across it, if some, you know, there's, there's all kinds of crazy things that, that can cause these, these artificial systems to be damaged. In athletic fields, having that be a smooth surface with no changes in topography is important uh, from a safety standpoint. In residential systems, it may not be a safety concern, but it certainly could be a drainage concern and it could be an aesthetic concern that if somebody were to, you know, inadvertently drive across the lawn, and cause some sort of divoting or, or tire track uh, in there, then maintenance and repair of that becomes a much more significant problem. Um, this is a typical type of repair that is made in that in that case on an on an athletic field. They have to come in, cut the, the field open, 
uh, pull back the carpets. This is a, a good picture of the actually the backing that I was talking about that's on these uh, synthetic turf grass systems when they're installed. And I want to point out, you know, they they market and and say that they have holes in them for drainage, but it, there there's hole there's a hole here, there's a hole here. They're about every eight to ten inches, and they're about a half inch diameter hole. They are not meant to move water through them quickly. Uh, they just are meant to drain water and and try to get it out of there. Once that water moves through into the the sub uh, subsurface, it will drain out of these athletic fields pretty quickly. But you can imagine on a compacted soil in a residential landscape, this is going to pool and pond uh, relatively soon. They can become hydrophobic. So when when we take that in consideration, along with our concern for trying to reduce runoff, if we've got a system that becomes hydrophobic as it ages, uh, now we're going to further reduce the, ch the chance or, or opportunity for infiltration and reduce, or sorry, increase the, uh, the pressure on our stormwater systems. How do we move forward? The, there, unfortunately, has been very little support for research uh, looking at the use of synthetic turf grass systems in, res being recorded. in residential landscapes. Um, we have, myself, uh, I've got, I, I have some infrastructure in place that I've been trying to sort of reallocate and look at this specifically. Uh, we've not been able to find funding for it yet. The synthetic turf grass industry, probably understandably, has very little interest in, in funding research that may not support their interests. Um, but we need to look at things like the impact of these heat island effect of putting the, you know, if we surround a home with synthetic turf, what is that going to do to the cooling load of the home? What is that going, you know, are there ways we can improve the infiltration and drainage of these systems to reduce that impact on the stormwater system? Uh, what is the impact on water quality? When we look at a natural turf grass system and the roots that are there that, that take up and remove and clean nutrients from that water and clean it, that doesn't exist in the synthetic turf grass system. So if we whatever water we do have that infiltrates or runs off is is not going to be cleaned and and maybe we don't know, but maybe is going to have additional pollutants added to it that weren't there before. Uh, the impact of leaf litter in a residential landscape. Leaf litter is not something that we worry about on, you know, on on natural turf grass systems. If you're mowing and mulching those leaves back into the into the uh, canopy, you don't have to do anything with them. You're actually adding those nutrients back into the soil as those leaves break down, and they're taken up by the turf and used by that. In a synthetic turf grass system, that leaf litter would become a, a pretty significant management problem. Uh, and then there's the pet waste issue that, it, you know, would brings its own issues to consider. In short, uh, what I hope to communicate is that synthetic turf is is not the answer for every residential landscape in Florida. There are too many unknowns specific to residential use of these systems, and we need to do more research. We need to have a better understanding of what those implications would be to our environment, what those implications would be to our water quality and our community. There are some cases where I, I am easily convinced and, and would be, you know, it would, would stand beside and, and support the use of synthetic turf in residential and commercial landscapes. One of the things that's very frustrating for me is when I see these little narrow uh, islands of turf that you know, or just a few square feet in size. Those are difficult to maintain from a, from a management standpoint if it's a natural turf grass system. Another area that is difficult to maintain is the area between houses on, on these like zero lot line or narrow, narrow homes, narrowly spaced homes where they don't get very much sun. Those types of situations, very, very small installations may make sense, but from a large scale, replacing whole landscapes that are natural turf with synthetic. I think there are too many unanswered questions to be able to support that. I, uh, I've got the link to this uh, here and I believe, let me see if I have that still 
pasted. Jason, um, this is Libby Carnahan, Florida Sea Grant, uh, UFIFIS. Yeah. Could I ask a question? Of course. I feel like what what I'm seeing with some of the homeowner use is that they're putting out the little patch um, and wanting it to be like for their dog um, as the dog potty spot. And so do you see like additional issues with that or do you see that as maybe one of the appropriate targeted uses of it? I think that the, that that's a good question. And I think that that's an, an interesting one to try to consider. So the the management of that. So if the you know if the pets go out and use that area for you know to go potty, what is being done with that? If they're cleaning up that waste and and that's the extent of it, and they're disposing that of that and however they would dispose of it or composting or whatever they may do, um, and it's a very small installation, that again, that would case by case scenario, but that may be appropriate. Um, the 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 broader situation that I understand that these you know the synthetic turf grass industry would like to see us support would be widespread use of entire landscapes or if you were to look at a the turf in a you know pick a neighborhood and you pick look at the turf that's in that landscape replacing all of that with synthetic under the argument that it's going to use less water that it's going to be better for the environment um, those are really hard arguments to support because we don't have research that actually shows that that's going to be the case. Use less water. I, I, I personally struggle with that because when you look at turf grass systems and, and their performance throughout Florida, if you don't irrigate them, sure, they, in the spring, they may go dormant for a little bit. They'll be off color for a little bit, but they will survive. They will green up. And for the remainder of the season, they will do well without irrigation. Uh, it, the water use and the perception of excessive water use in turf grass systems and the and, and residential landscapes has been shown time and time again to be more of a people problem than a plant problem. The plants don't need as much water as they're be, get, being given, and that unfortunately is something that you know is, is a hard one to to get nailed down. And so to be absolutely clear, the um, Florida turf industry would generally be opposed to the use of this artificial turf in landscapes because they would say that their turf is natural and better. I won't. Speak, I won't speak. Or they're not like incorporating it in and and having it as one of their like turf options, are they? Like, is the turf industry promoting artificial turf at all? No, the the artificial turf is being promoted by the Synthetic Turf Council. And that is a umbrella organization that manufacturers are members of. It's basically, basically, from what I understand, kind of a lobbying group that will that that tries to find, like they they did in in 2013, 2014, when they approached IFAS and said we would like to have synthetic turf be considered as part of a Florida friendly landscape. You know that that wasn't a manufacturer coming to us. That was a a, an umbrella organization coming on behalf of their manufacturers and installers. Um, no, the the turf grass producers in Florida, their their business, their product is natural turf grass systems. I, I won't speak for them. I don't. I don't think I have to speak for them to say that that's that this is not something that they are they are not promoting this. How they feel about it, I'm not going to speak for them. Um, but. It, I will say that you know my colleagues and I at the University of Florida that work with natural turf grass systems who have done research on natural turf grass systems have and have and, and myself I did an extensive literature review looking at artificial the research that support or has actually been done on artificial turf grass systems there is nothing that shows that they actually improve water quality there's nothing that shows that they reduce runoff uh, there's nothing that shows that they improve microbial activity, that they improve wildlife habitat. Uh, they, they, it, that, it, that evidence is not there. Okay, do we have any other questions from folks that are either online or in the room? Like Hi, um, this is Susan Haddock. I'm with the Hillsborough County Extension. Okay. Um, and just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, I know Lib I work with Libby. Hi, Libby. 
um, just making a comment regarding um, use of artificial turf for, for pet use. Um, there are products available. Um, one of them is the Pet Lou made, out of Aust made from Australia that's designed specifically for that, but it has an underlayment that you take into your house and you wash out. The problem with using artificial turf as a, as a pet pee area out in a landscape is that there is no, it, it doesn't allow the infiltration of that into the root area of something like turf grass. So when you have urea coming from a dog, it's uptaken by natural, natural grass. You know, when a dog pees, it turns the grass green. When you use artificial turf, it isn't uptaken. So it's in there in that top layer. When we have heavy rains, that urea is more likely to be washed into a stormwater drain, which is what we are trying to prevent. The other side of that is when you utilize artificial turf only for a pet waste area, you still have to clean it. Disinfectants used to clean artificial turf could be more damaging to the environment than what is used to maintain artificial turf. Um, I just recently um, gave a, a summary of, of some national research. Penn State has a little bit, mainly related to sports fields, to the Environmental Protection Commission in Hillsborough County. And when we look at that, we're relating the use of artificial turf to Florida-friendly landscaping. Is it in making improvements in reduction of water use? Is it making improvements in reducing compaction? Is it making improvements in reduction of use of chemicals? Um, and, and so far, we haven't seen that with artificial turf in, in residential areas. And as Jason says, there, there are very limited uses of it for residential areas. And of course it's used um, quite a bit in, um, for athletic fields, especially for indoor practice fields that don't get sunshine and in areas where there may be environmental conditions that restrict the use of um, natural turf grass in those areas. Um, so anyways, in Hillsborough County, I'm certainly happy to help address any um, questions or concerns in addition to um, what Jason has already um, spoken about. That's great. Please uh, keep in touch with us on that issue because I'm sure there are gonna be more questions. Is there anyone else who'd like to be yeah. recognized? Can I just expand yes, on some of the discussion? Yeah, this did come up during the Tempest Estro Programs Policy Board meeting. And I think the challenge that exists within our municipalities is the infill development that's occurring. So, you know, a large site plan new development will have to demonstrate a net benefit through the district's permitting process for either stormwater retention infiltration and nutrient removal. But on these case by case homeowner infill development um, where this sort of application would probably be uh, most readily applied in the urban environment. I think the, the concern is that the municipalities don't have any rules in effect to control sort of these conditions and how can we as a region sort of embrace that net benefit approach at the larger site planning scale uh, at the smaller infill development scale within our, our urban environment. And that, I think that's the challenge and why we're bringing it to the agency on bait management's attention. Because I think, you know, as we ask homeowners to work with us in, in order to improve the Tampa Bay estuary, you know, there has to be some concessions on their end in terms of demonstrating a net benefit towards the municipal stormwater systems. Um, if, if, if everything I was just mentioned is, you know, a concern, you know, they have to, in my opinion, show or demonstrate how application or artificial turf would would be, uh, you know, alleviating those conditions that were just mentioned. And that that's sort of the, the uh, limbo that a, a lot of our municipal governments are in right now in the smaller infill sort of parcels where this is being applied. And, you know, whether or not it becomes more of a trend and, and it needs to be addressed with with additional regulations, I think that's part of the discussion that's being had by municipal government. So I'm not offering any solutions, just bringing it out, you know, raising those points because it is challenging um, for, you know, those smaller homeowner sites that are considering artificial turf for their land cover. So this is Susan again, and I just want to mention um, just on behalf of UF IFAS that when we have these large scale developments that are challenged with areas where they want, where they're, where they're deciding whether, to, whether or not to use turf grass, we have a lot of other options on design that we can offer them that are alternatives to turf grass, but, but also 
utilize natural plants rather than putting a synthetic material in. And I'll say one of the downsides of the synthetic material is that it doesn't last forever. And when you remove that, it ends up in the landfill. When you remove and replace any sort of natural plant material, it can be composted or tilled back into that soil for the benefit of the environment. So, um, so just ask them to reach out to us and we're very happy to help them with alternatives. Thank you, Susan. Do we have another? Yes, go ahead. Sure. This is Ann Paul. So I'm just wondering, are there, are there, are there any permit requirements for installation at this point in the cities and counties for install, you know, installing artificial turf? I don't know. Um, so that was, this is Maya Burke with the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. That was sort of the genesis of the question um, that basically the local governments are having to assess whether or not these are in compliance with their stormwater ordinances and this question about whether or not it's contributing to runoff or there's actually a, a, an infiltration coefficient that's meaningful associated with these. And so um, the answer is in most municipalities, I think, no, but they're looking for guidance and research that could help incorporate that information in their land development regulations. Thank you, ma'am. Does that, anyone else have a question they want to bring up? Um, this is Sally Thompson. My question or my concern might be, are there homeowners associations or new developments that are putting in requirements? Because I know with respect to planting and whatever, sometimes what the homeowners associations require are in conflict what is, what, with what is Florida friendly or have been. Has there been any, have there been any, any issues there? I'll speak just briefly from, you know, from my own understanding and, and experience with it. The Florida Friendly Landscaping Program has, has had some challenges with our recommendations and, and our understanding and, and communicating our understanding of how turf grass systems grow and, and, and are, can be managed, should be managed and how that conflicts with some of the expectations of homeowners associations. Um, I think that to be blunt, I think some of the homeowners associations are, are putting homeowners and management companies in situations where they are using more water than they need to out of fear of the repercussions of something going awry. Um, along those lines, years ago, 100 years ago, when I took the Master Gardener program, one of the challenges was for people in homeowners in developments um, being required to plant things that really weren't didn't fit in or wouldn't weren't appropriate. And I know laws have changed, but I don't know if the turf part because we weren't even talking about turf twenty years of turf artificial turf twenty years ago. The primary principle, you know. One of the primary first principles of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is the right plant, right place. Right, and, and that is key to even what we're discussing here with you know turf in the landscape. I, I while my career has been built around the turf grass industry and and research associated with that, I'll be the first to tell you that turf should not dominate. There's no need for turf to be the dominant plant in the landscape, uh, particularly in residential landscapes. That being said, turf provides so many added benefits to protecting and, and improving water quality that strategically used both from an aesthetic and, and a functional standpoint, it can serve you know, a, a number of benefits to both the homeowner and our, our environment, but it does not need to, to dominate the landscape. And I think that's one of the things that the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program has tried to to encourage people to consider is that rather than having broad swaths of, of turf grass planted around their homes to try to have a more diverse landscape. Okay, do we have any other questions? Yes. Hi, Jason, this is Sinead Borcher, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Thank you for making me even more irritated about this than I already was. I just have um, a question about research and PhD students. So it seems like the science is there to convince people that this is a bad idea, right? If somebody tells me the heat envelope, 
I Sorry, lost you a little bit. Huh? I, you cut out for just a second. I didn't want to miss anything you were saying. Oh, um, yeah. So if somebody's going to tell me that the heat envelope is going to increase our house if I put a bunch of artificial turf down. I was, I was curious, it seems like this is kind of hype for a PhD student dissertation to just kind of gauge people's attitudes on what sort of native cover is going to be acceptable because I changed the paradigm around grass and, you know, everybody just appropriate form of landscaping and maybe some of the extension folks have a perspective on this but it seems like it would be a good dissertation topic excellent yeah i think that the, you know one of the things that uh, when we look at research funding in the turf grass industry uh, we don't have a lot of support we we have not traditionally had a lot of support addressing the needs of our residential landscapes from a research standpoint. And that's one of the things that <clears throat> through partnerships with uh, various water management districts over the past 10 or 15 years, we've been able to increase some funding there. We've had uh, significant funding in the past through FDEP, trying to look at you know our, our management and research uh, addressing issues in the urban landscape. But um, certainly this is, you make a good point. There's There are a number of things here that specifically looking at artificial turf grass systems in the residential landscape that need to be addressed and better understood before we make, you know, widespread spread acceptance or changes to what that landscape might look like. Thank you. Did you have anything else? Okay, well, I think just from the feedback you've gotten at this meeting, you know that uh, the folks around here are sympathetic to seeing what else we can do. And I've been chatting, not really chatting, but doing notes back and forth with Alana. And she had a suggestion if you want to make that. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, the ABM used to take actions on issues of concern for the region. And this might be an opportunity for the ABM to once again, take some kind of action um, whether that's even just compiling research uh, to send off to municipalities and counties in the area so they can have better informed decisions. So I just wanted to mention that and see if any of the ABM members would be interested in that. We could always send this back to the Natural Resources and Environmental Impact Review Committee, which is more like a working group to, to work more on this issue. So I'm just going to put that suggestion out there. And of course, it would come to an ABM member to kind of carry that forward. Kind of the second on what Maya said earlier, um, as a municipality representative, I think the municipal I know the municipalities are looking for um, some some uh, input from experts on best policy or best practice for our our cities. Whether whether we you know if we allow uh, turf in our neighborhoods, if we count that as impervious surface and go against their impervious surface ratio, um, what that looks like and how we appropriately, uh, I would say, discourage the use of, of artificial turf grass in residential neighborhoods. Um, as a municipality, nobody's got anything on the books now, and we're anxious to, to do something before, before it becomes an issue that we have to kind of retroactively try to manage. Um, Mayor Brown, we hear a mandate, so I'm going to ask uh, our staff to bring this up to the Natural Resources Committee at SHU. Doctor, if you would be available if, but if not in person, at least um, virtually, when this group meets, the Natural Resources Committee meets, and uh, Mayor Brown, if either you could sit in on that meeting, along with our staff, to give the interaction regarding the concerns that cities and counties have, because I know that in the development of land use and permitting and everything else, this would be a vitally important issue to get on top of. So would that be all right with yeah. you? Land this is Liz Carnahan, can I? Yes, go right can ahead. I... Okay, this is just um, a, separate, <laughs> a separate issue that I've been noticing, uh, and I don't know if we'd wanna couple it with this or keep it separate, but it seems, I live in St. Pete, and it seems like the land development review for new development doesn't necessarily speak to or coordinate with the codes department because I see a lot of, 
you know, cedar fences being put in a foot from the sidewalk and then fountain grasses being planted that are overgrowing the sidewalk before the house is even sold and that violates codes. So I don't know, you know, how the system are. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just that like just in terms of, you know, I think that these developers have the checklist that was mentioned by someone that like they have to put in so many of this kind of plant and that kind of plant and maybe with the size of the homes they're building, it just doesn't make sense or maybe they're not doing it in the right way and need more um, advice from landscape professionals. And so I didn't know if we wanna attack several things. There's also the tree list that each city has uh, that they recommend to their landscapers that probably could be updated for climate change um, impact. I think that there are probably a lot of areas that could attach to it. We want to focus on that as the nexus point, but certainly what you've mentioned could be one of the issues that could be referenced in developing different observations or recommendations. So keep your brain working. And I know that Woody here, because he is in a very important position, is very sensitive every day with stuff like this. So whatever ideas that any of you have uh, would be important for this committee to consider when they address this issue. Can, um, Alana? Yeah, can I just follow yeah, up ahead. on the discussion? Yeah. So ultimately, is there opportunity to integrate this in some sort of planning document like the Regional Resiliency Action Plan as an amendment? Mm -hmm. uh, would that be sort of the nexus of next steps after the discussion and recommendations come out of the, the committee? That, that could certainly be considered, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And we're still developing that plan. So I think we're, we're still accepting input. And, and so we can definitely pass this on. Thank you. Good idea. And so is, is there interest from the ABM members? I'll turn this over to you to kind of carry forward with this discussion and maybe produce something um, like some sort of recommendations to um, our local governments. What do you all, I want to hear from, from the ABM members. What, what do you all think? Just feel free to speak up, those of you who are online. Well, I'm, you want to say I'm, I'm asking that the Natural Resources Committee schedule this and take it up and then inviting those, not just the people on the committee, but any of the others that are interested to participate. Is that a motion that requires a second? Uh, I can't make a motion, but you sure can. <laughs> okay, uh, Libby Carnahan, I move that we bring uh, the information on artificial turf to the Agency on Bay Management's Natural Resources Committee, and that we invite Jason to come back and discuss the issue further and how we can help Good. government. Uh, I'll you, second Lee. that. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second that. Chris Anastasia. All, right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, why is Melanie Weed up there? Does she have a question? <laughs> Sally? I, I'm still new to this techie stuff, so. I'm not sure why I'm up there either, Barbara. <laughs> well, you're a center of attention. <laughs> okay. Um, we were going to do uh, the swim report, but because we want to give them sufficient time We've already exchanged with Mark and uh, we're going to schedule this so that they have the time they wish to share with us their important findings. I am going to ask though that we move to uh, item 10 for our round table discussion. We are not exactly stymied by 11, sometime the time of 11. Um, we'd like to allow a little bit of time here from all of you to, um, get some interaction. I'm asking our vice chair to carry this on because shortly I have to go to another meeting. So um, what do you do with the floor, please? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, thank you. Um, the idea on this item number 10 is to just uh, bring up some topics that are of interest to you all and your field um, and stuff that we could we could address and be informed on here as the agency on bay management and and build some opinions and some um and share best practices and that type of stuff so so you all are the experts um i'm just an elected official so so um please share with me any ideas that you have 
for future topics, um, for challenges that you see in your field that you think that the experts that are assembled here uh, in this group um, can help with. Not everybody at one time, Doc. <laughs> Anybody online that has a, a suggestion? Okay. If yeah, certainly if you um, if you go home tonight and think, boy, I wish I would have mentioned that. Um, get in touch with us so we can put it on on an agenda so we can have a brief, at least a brief discussion about moving forward with these ideas uh, in the future. Yeah. We're hearing anything. Nothing. I think. Um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, this is Libby. I've been trying to rack my brain because I know I had things to bring to y'all, but. Um, Beach renourishment, of course, is that huge loaded issue. And I know the Barrier Island Government Council deals with a lot of things specifically just between them, but I didn't know if that's something we wanna talk about. Well, and I guess it's kind of outside the bay, so I don't remember um, how we choose those jurisdictions if we talk about beach issues, but um, certainly it seems like people don't really, um, you know, they don't fully understand the amount of beach renourishment that goes on and how it's pretty much stabilized our beaches and allowed them to stay in place. But um, yeah, as I'm talking, I'm thinking that's that's probably more of a big C talk than a than an ABM. Yeah, this is Tom Reese. I, I was just gonna ask for this committee if we, I could get help. We're working with um, EPC on making living shorelines easier to permit. And they did a great job of rewriting the rule and actually lowering the permit fees for this. But the big problem is if only for the freshwater systems because the Port Authority or Hillsborough County owns a submerged bottom lands. We need the Port to mimic the rules that EPC just enacted a few months ago. And I just, they haven't really moved on that. It would be great to have the agency on bay management, you know, support asking them to please consider this because if they could, they don't have to write new rules, they could just mimic the rules. That would mean all the estuarine portions of Hillsborough County you would have that same benefit of easier permitting and less costly for living shorelines. And Tom, do you know how that affects or how, how that's affected in other counties, whether Bell's County is limited? Yeah, I don't know all the Pinellas County's rules as well. I mean, they do regulate um, docks and et cetera. But as far as the agency that has issues permits for li living shorelines in Hillsborough County, it's the EPC. And so it's great that they change the rules, but if we can't get the Port Authority to do the same, then it's only touching a fraction of what areas that could benefit from these reduce fees and streamlining permit. So essentially um, what what I would suggest is looking at any barriers for local shoreline um, production in, in the whole Tampa Bay estuary um, and, and see how we can take some action to encourage the folks to change their policies so that, so that it's easier to to um, establish local shorelines as opposed to just you know, over seawalls. Exactly. And so the first and easiest one is the Port Authority right now. They, they, are, they could really make a difference with a small amount of effort. Um, and then we can look and make sure that other municipalities or counties have any regulations that they are encouraging or at least making it a level playing field. Because right now you can be replaced your seawall with exemptions. But if you want to put something in natural, it's full permit. And so we're trying to make that easier. Any other thoughts or comments? Maybe, uh, uh, Tom, maybe at the December meeting, you can come in and give maybe a, a larger presentation on, on this topic. And then from there, maybe the ABM can, you know, decide to take action, such as writing a letter of support um, or encouragement to the port, encouraging them to adopt uh, these, these things. That's pretty similar to what we did about that. 
Oh, with the restoration. Resource committee behind this, and then we use the interesting thing manage and then provide a report. Yeah, that's my call to that one. Yeah. Not as effective. Okay, <laughs> and, and to the mayor, to the mayor's point, I think making it largely accessible to the estuaries. So I think on the canal side, it'd be probably to the state, I think would have jurisdiction primarily aquatic preserve lands that would be considered at that point. Ultimately, what we're going to have to do is take these different recommendations that come back to the full ABM, and then if the ABM blesses it, it will go to the regional council because we want to make sure that we're not just sitting around here chatting with each other. We want these discussions to end up with results. So when you participate in these discussions, know you're being reported, that this information is deliberately going to be given to the regional council so they can take action when you all bless it and say, take it there. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for the suggestions. Uh, I think we'll move on to item number 11, which is another uh, request. The first one is another request for, for input on base soundings, article ideas, uh, stuff that your agencies are doing uh, across the board. So we ask for this every more, every meeting and uh, we put out a, a base soundings uh, article every, every or pretty, pretty close as well. So pretty yes. close to weekly. Vicki, how often do you put it out? Very close to weekly. Okay. So if anybody has any, any articles, um, please send those to us. Uh, and, and we'll get that published. Is there anything else that we need to bring up? Um, if anyone has any topic ideas for the next meeting? Yeah, aside from what we've been... already discussed. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna be looking forward to hearing from you all with ideas about things that you're doing because everyone in here has an important role and we will be scheduling where we have scheduled our next meeting for December the 8th. So if there's nothing further to be brought forward, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you everyone online for joining us. And thank you all to you who joined us in person. Very commendable. Please make sure you take some munchkins on your way out. Yeah. Lana, are you ready for me to end the meeting? Basically.